Welcome to Midwest Architecture and Design. My name is Jordan Powers and I'm an architectural photographer based in Southern Minnesota, photographing projects across the Midwest for architects, designers, and builders. And today I'm talking with Tim Ayen of TE Studio based in Minneapolis. And one of the reasons that I wanted to talk with Tim specifically is because as I was doing my research uh, on architects and designers to interview within the mid throughout the Midwest and, and Minnesota specifically, is that Tim's firm is heavily focused on this idea of the passive house, which is uh, a design principle, an energy efficiency principle that was brought over from Europe. And I think it was developed over the last 30 years, if I'm not mistaken. And um, it was uh, it's something that Tim has focused his entire firm around, is this passive house concept. So I wanted to dive in a lot about that and understand what that means from a layperson's perspective. Um, Tim himself is actually born and raised in Germany and went to school for architecture and came over to the United States around 20 years ago. And he's bringing a lot of these European principles that he's learned, especially with this passive house concept, concept into his practice here in Minneapolis. So I really hope you enjoy this interview with Tim from TE Studio. If you want to follow him on Instagram, you can do so at TE Studio. And you can follow me on Instagram at Jordan Powers without the vowels. Enjoy this episode with Tim Ayan. All right, but Tim, thank you for inviting me to your home. Uh, we've talked a little bit on the phone prior to this and yep. know a little bit about your background, but let's just start from the beginning. Uh, let just give us your background. Let's let's hear a little bit about where you came from. Yeah, absolutely. I'd love to. So I grew up in Germany. Um, I've been here about 20 years. I came here in my late 20s. And uh, growing up in Germany, uh, my parents decided uh, early on uh, in my childhood to build a home. So when I was three years old, they did. And I had a lot of exposure to construction side uh, and really developed a fascination and love for, you know, crawling around things being built, observing that. And my family developed a friendship with this architect who became a little bit of a mentor and guide for me. Uh, later on, my family had no background in construction whatsoever. And uh, during my school years, I would uh, spend summers uh, you know, working with him, interning. And he had always suggested that if you want to go into architecture, you got to learn a trade from the ground up. You got to learn how to do this properly and what it means to actually build something. And so after high school, I decided uh, I'm going to become a carpenter. Mm -hmm. And uh, in Germany, where I grew up, we had a great apprenticeship system. And so I took advantage of that and did that first uh, before I entered into architecture school um, to, to then later complete that. So my journey has been really one that started at about age three. and. Mm. Um, it's interesting when you talk with other adults uh, when they're talking about how they found their profession and their career and sometimes through detours. And uh, in my life, it was the complete opposite. I knew since I was a little boy that I wanted to be involved in buildings. And um, even though it's been, you know, it, it, it can be a tough career, um, I, I haven't been able to get away from it. Mm -hmm. And I asked you this question before uh, we hit record, <laughs> um, but is... is architecture, having a home architecturally designed common in, in Germany or Europe in general? Or? It certainly is, and it was maybe even more when I was a kid, but it still is today. So in Central Europe, um, there's just more of a, uh, a, it's more commonplace that an architect would come into a residential project in some uh, uh, locations that may even be required because the complexity of planning may be such that that's not something where you can just dial up a builder and they can do it. And, and the other thing um, that I should mention is that an architect in Germany is a little bit of a general contractor as well. Mm. Um, so it is quite common that the architect procures all the quotes and then does uh, site supervision. So the, the, the actual job of an architect extends beyond what we typically do here in the U.S. Although, interestingly enough, my practice um, is, is much more like it, it would have been in Germany. Mm -hmm. I, I assist my general contractors quite a bit. And um, while I don't typically general entire projects, I certainly have for my own purposes. And so I, I consider myself more of a generalist in that space. Yeah, and we talked yeah. a little bit that, about that when, <clears throat> when we first arrived here, like the, where, where we're at now, your location. Yeah. Um, you had a hand in, in this project. Is, is yeah, it generally absolutely. like that with... with it, are you that hands-on with all your projects? The no, part? not necessarily. Okay. And I think builders would hate me for it. There's yeah. liability and everything else. Yeah. But um, I do love building stuff. And on this house, I, I, I joined the crew from day one. 
um, started building the foundation and the framing and many other things along the way. So when I have an opportunity, I really appreciate it. But on client projects, typically not. My work is much more in the supervision, um, helping procure specialty products, you know, and, and really inserting myself in spaces where I see there's a need. Mm-hmm. I don't want to get in anybody's way. But, um, you know, years ago, my, my business partner and I uh, try to describe this to people uh, with a metaphor saying that, you know, if the road to a certified passive house is full of potholes, we have sort of learned to become those pothole mm-hmm. fillers. We step in where there is a need or a shortcoming uh, or a difficulty and whatever that may be. So I've certainly helped people, you know, explaining to them how to properly tape up a window, make an air seal to the to the building and things like that. Mm-hmm. We're very hands on on days where there's performance testing uh, because there's often little touch-ups here, there, and everywhere. But mm-hmm. the actual physical construction was certainly unique. Um, I look at it almost like a sabbatical when I built this house yeah. here. I uh, put the studio in, into low gear for a little while and basically was here every day for eight to ten hours. Mm. Yeah. Well, so and I want to get into the, the <clears throat> passive house uh, discussion further because that's something that you're obviously centering a lot of your business around. Well, all yes. of your business around. Yes. So, but I, I do want to go back a little bit to, um, so it's been 20 years since you've been here. Do you still keep an eye on what's happening in Europe? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Now, has it changed much over the last 20 years or is, is there like an American influence happening there? Interesting. Uh, definitely not an American influence or on, is it vice on versa? architecture. It, it is the other way okay. around. So, um, you know, having gone through architecture school in the 90s when Germany was already on a trajectory to carbon neutrality and a renewable grid, they had already taken initial steps, you know, learning to air seal, insulate, do all the things that we're just getting into in North America right now. Mm -hmm. So I would say there's easily a 20 to 30 year leap um, that you see in Central Europe. And I I would say Central Europe because Germany isn't exclusive in that space. um, But I would say that... <clears throat> the epicenter, the sort of Silicon Valley for high performance building is, is probably like constant. So you're looking at Germany, Austria, Switzerland um, as really having a hand in that. And so, yeah, there's no reverse influence that I can sense. And I do keep in touch simply because the, the, the advantage that they currently have, we can learn from that. And honestly, there are some resources that we need out of that market at the moment because it doesn't exist here so Let, we, give yeah. me, what's an example of something like that so, uh, so windows instance, behind me uh, okay. for instance uh, most of the windows that we work with are imports um, and that is simply because uh, american manufacturers haven't embraced a high performance window yet uh, especially for cold climates and i should segue there real briefly in saying that a, a passive house has to hold itself to the same performance targets no matter where it's built in the world So if you're in a moderate climate, it may be an easy thing to do. You don't need much insulation. You don't need a very specific window, perhaps. But when you're in an extreme climate zone like this, with negative 25 Fahrenheit as our winter design temperature, the bar is raised. And so that means we have to look to, you know, really high performing product. Um, The best comparison to make that most people might get in this day and age is when you drive an electric car, right? You get that Tesla out of California and they tell you 300 miles on a charge. You drive it in the winter in Minnesota, (laughs) lights going, heater going, everything else, you get whatever, 180 miles out of the same battery. A building is, it's the same thing, right? We simply use more energy uh, typically uh, to, to maintain the same temperature and comfort on the indoor, in the indoors. And so with a passive house, that would still be true, even though we reduce that significantly, um, but we have to overcome that difference, that delta T. And so that's where these specialty products come in and services too. Um, We use a certifier that's located there. We have some specialty consultants there. Um, And generally I find those conversations to be very inspiring because they've solved problems that we're just coming up to. So let's talk, talk to me like I'm a lay person, which I am, because as, as I mentioned, like a, a big part of this podcast is I'm trying to understand architecture a little yes. more as a photographer. So what I do know is that is very little, but I do know there's like the, the, the lead and there's, there's other different certifications yes. for environmentally friendly and conscious yeah. homes. Where, explain to me like I'm five, uh, like a layperson, what is the difference between a passive home 
versus all these other types of certification? Oh, absolutely. It's pretty straightforward. Passive House is a building energy standard. That's all it does. Okay. A lot of the other programs out there are more broadly oriented. So LEED, for instance, has indoor air quality requirements, material requirements, and things like that. It also has an energy component. Uh, and generally speaking, the passive house is much more rigorous with the energy piece than any of the other standards out there. And so that makes it more of a companion to those. You can use it standalone, of course, but um, it, it wouldn't replace a lead or something else. If, if a client is interested in a broad spectrum of sustainability, then they might partner passive house with another certification doesn't happen very often, but we've done it on two, three occasions in recent years. So that's the main difference. Passive house, building energy only at a very high level. And when I say high, I want to be careful not to put it on a pedestal. Sure. Because that happens in the public realm a lot. And people think in these terms of good, better, best. Right. And then they want to put passive house as best. Lately, when I talk about it, I describe to people that passive house is foundational, not aspirational. Okay. And what I mean by that is that the performance it offers and the energy reduction that it delivers makes it the perfect platform to get to carbon neutrality in buildings. Anything short of passive house struggles. Why? Because you want to be able to create an offset on site ideally. And we found, particularly in our climate zone, the only shot we have at that is if we build to passive house standard, meaning the space that you have on your roof, if you fill it with photovoltaic cells, PV system, you can actually generate an annual offset to capture the entire building, all loads within it, if you have a passive house. If you don't go to that level, D you don't. Dumb, dumb that down for me just a sure. little bit. What does that mean to the average person Like for the, when you're talking about the roof? Right. It's more of a we the people problem, perhaps, Okay. Um, because we have two choices how we attack the future. If you consider that we're still using energy wastefully and now we want to be carbon neutral as a society, we have to make the big pie of wasted energy from green resources, solar, wind, nothing with carbon in it, no sure. gas station, no natural gas in the next 20, 30 years. Keep that in mind. Mm -hmm. That stuff's gone. So how do we do it, right? So we can go two tracks. We can try to make all this energy from renewable clean resources which is a humongous investment in a grid that is very different from what we have in a very short time. Or we can replace some of that energy with energy efficiency, meaning we simply do away with it. We don't even have to make it. And passive house is a pathway to that. Okay. We reduce the heating load in buildings typically by about 90%. So I can eliminate something that is typically delivered with either natural gas or fuel oil by 90%, just gone, doesn't exist anymore. Therefore, I don't have to build that grid to make it. Sure. Yeah. Okay, so uh, real world example. So we're sitting yep. in the home. Uh, we obviously lugged a bunch of equipment in here and we're in a flannel shirt. I was pretty warm. Yes. But since mm -hmm. we've been sitting here for the last 15 minutes or so, I'm perfectly comfortable um, and there's no airflow that I'm aware of happening right now no. is, is what I'm experiencing right now. The, the, the comfort wearing, essentially I'm wearing winter clothes right now in a, a 70 degree humid day in a, in a rainy, humid day in Minnesota. Am I experiencing the, the design of, of, of that energy efficiency or am I just reading into this? <laughs> um, I would say today you're probably reading into okay. it. If we were sitting here on a day where it's minus 30 outside, okay. you'd still be sitting there in your flannel with the, the, the sleeves rolled up and you'd be just as comfortable as you are right now. Okay. That's when you're experiencing the full effect of that, that's, that's what I'm trying to, yeah. that's what, what I'm wondering. Because obviously, yeah. you know, we're, not, we're in Minnesota, the climate's going to swing in the next three yes. to four months. Um, I'm just curious as to like what happens you know, with, with, so what, well, actually let me back up. So what are you, you obviously have air conditioning and climate control in here, but are you, um, are you, is this, is this home not running off of any carbon? 
Uh, Correct. Okay. And so I, there's two parts to that. One is how Sorry, we Sorry, do I don't know how to ask that question. That's quite all right. Yeah. So there, the one is, you know, how do we condition it? Or maybe what's the size and the equipment? And then the other one is, is more on the, on the loads, that, that, that massive reduction. Um, so I'll, I'll try to get to both of these. Um, so in Minnesota, a passive house will still have some heating and some cooling. And that's just because our environment outside is fairly brutal. We have extremes on both ends. Mm -hmm. But that setup is only about a tenth of the capacity of what a conventional home might need. So we utilize a, a piece of equipment called an air to air heat pump. Okay. Uh, there's an outdoor unit and an indoor unit and they're connected. It's all electric. There's no gas hookup to this building. And what it does is in the summer months that we're entering now, it will reject the heat from the inside to the outside unit, similar to what an air conditioner does. In the winter, the whole system reverses and it will be able to squeeze energy even out of minus 25 air and provide heat to the inside of the building wow. in that way. And in the process, it uses very, very little electricity. So that's the general makeup. If you build a passive house in a moderate climate, you may not need that at all. There are passive houses that don't really have a heating and cooling system whatsoever. Um, they all have a ventilation system, which is separate. That's a piece of equipment that just floods the building with fresh air and takes out the stale. Okay. So instead of the bath fan that you may have in your typical home in Minnesota, we have a house, whole house system. So okay. we put fresh air into all living spaces and exhaust it from the kitchen and the bathrooms and the laundry room all day long. And there's heat recovery in the main unit, so in the, you don't have an energy penalty. Uh, okay. It preheats air coming in in the winter, pre-cools it in the summer. And if you're in a moderate climate, you can temper that airflow a little bit, and that's all you'll ever need. Uh, it isn't until you get to a climate zone like ours that we go back to a more conventional system with an actual heater and cooling system. But again, they're tiny. The best comparison I can make to you is if this were that day, negative 25 outside, um, the sun isn't shining in the windows, which is another component we haven't touched on. The peak heat load for this building is about 3,500 watts. And that equates to about two hair dryers going at the same time. Hmm. The house is about 2,200 square feet, so we can heat the whole building literally if you held them up in the air and they were going they would heat this house through that period of time wow. and okay. on any given day when the sun is shining the big windows behind me are solar collectors effectively oh really yes the low winter sun will fire right in and all the way through the space and about two-thirds of the energy we need for heat in any given year comes through the windows alone wow yeah okay well there there's my next question so uh again knowing very little about architecture we talked a little bit about how the general public views architecture as what they see. Yes. It's all about the looks. So obviously you have to design, a, a, you know, you don't have to, does it have to be a modern structure or that's just kind of the, the sure. aesthetic you're going for? But does it start with, you mentioned it being more foundational. Does it start with that in mind, like when you're, when you're planning and, yes. and designing? So yeah. you start with the the energy efficiency and, and everything first, and then you, right. you build around that? Is that how it works? Yeah, okay. it is. I, I wanted to add one point because we skipped over that. The carbon neutrality piece is oh, really yeah. important to me. And so I said that we're all electric in this home. And so then the question is, where does it come from? And mm -hmm. in this particular yeah. case, we have a photovoltaic array on the roof. And that on an average year will make enough electricity to supply the entire site. But since that happens off and on when the sun shines, we still are grid connected and our grid uh, plan is 100% wind power. So mm -hmm. when the sun doesn't shine and we're not getting it off our roof, we're getting 100% wind energy. And that gets us to carbon neutrality. Where's the wind energy coming from? It's mostly southern Minnesota. So okay. we're connected to Excel Energy's grid. And okay. they have a wind contingent. And it's scattered through the state. But most sure. of it is probably there. Some of it may be in adjacent states. They can only sell what they make. And so there is an end to the capacity there. So at there's the like a reserve set aside that, that you pay into and then it kicks on when needed or? Uh, basically, it's all automatic. I'm connected okay. to both my own solar panels and the grid at the same time. And the way electricity works, it just basically grabs it from wherever it can get it. Wow. And if I'm making more electricity than I'm consuming, my access will go back on that grid and they can sell it as green electricity or Got clean it. electricity. Okay. 
So I just wanted to complete sure. that story no, because it's did, a yeah. really important yeah. piece because that takes us into 2050 when all buildings are supposed to be carbon neutral. So we've done that already in 2020. Okay. And, and actually prior to this with other projects, we've been in this space for about 15 years. Um, so then your question to Passive House being foundational, it, um, it does enter into the planning process right from the get-go. And it starts with orientation. When I talk about the windows becoming the heaters for sure. the house, they want to face south. And ideally, we have solar exposure. In the urban core, it's tough to get. And that's why this lot spoke to my family, because this open. is fully open to the south. Not all of them are, so we grab as much as we can. If we can't get it, we can't get it. We still can build the proverbial cooler box, fully insulated, air sealed, and retain heat. And that works in the same way. But the free heat comes through the window. Sure. So it's a different site orientation. You really have to think about that. And um, I was just working on a lecture yesterday where I, I created some slides around that showing how there was an old home on this side and we essentially turned the footprint 90 degrees. The old home would have faced east and west with a broad side and our house faces south on the broad side. Okay. And whenever we do work, especially in the urban core, you really notice that because a lot of the homes in the Twin Cities face east-west. And so we always turn them. Um, that's the first hmm. order of events. And then the next thing is was that just, putting windows Was that in. just not looking toward the future? Or is it just like not knowing? Like, I, I never thought about that before. When, they, yeah. when they're doing city planning back in the 18 and 1900s, you know, planning everything east and west. I, I would have never thought about that. And, and it isn't so much, you know, the east-west lots are actually great because they, they have depth in that dimension. So if I turn a house, I can face the broad side or the mm -hmm. long side south. So in a way, they got it right because most of the grid faces that way. It's just when people put homes on them, they, they turn them the wrong way around. Mm. But they're not all that way. And I, I will say it's just general ignorance, uh, you know, on behalf of planners, the public builders. They don't understand passive solar heat gains. It's right. not something that's taught. Well, and that's not something they would, have, they would have known a lot about back then um, anyway. So. Maybe even. Uh, yeah. But, you know, in some cases, there are the origins, I should say, for passive solar structures are really in the United States and the particularly in the Midwest. Hmm. And so since the 60s and 70s, there were people here experimenting with that, entirely fueling them in that way. Hmm. Um, we have, um, I, I've been to a place called Solar Town in Wisconsin, where you have a whole little city that was developed based on solar uh, heat gains, past solar heat gains. Hmm. Um, I was just uh, out in New Mexico where they have the earth ships, which are all passive solar buildings. There's hmm. a whole development of those. So I think there's a contingent of people in the United States that has understood that for at least 40, maybe 50 years. Okay. Uh, I would say, as with many things in life, you know, the best idea doesn't always prevail. Mm -hmm. And so it's not for lack of yelling, but who's listening. Right. And that's still being ignored. If you go into a typical subdivision in Minnesota today and you see these boxes that are dropped any which way, some of them have zero windows on the south side, even though they could, or they have the massive garage on the south side, even if they could have had it on the north. It just goes to demonstrate that there is fundamental lack of understanding of how a good building works. This isn't just warmth, this is also daylight. Yeah. As you noticed, it's a cloudy overcast day. We don't need any lights on in here right now. We get plenty mm -hmm. of daylight and it does something to you. And this is, I like talking about those subjects more these days than just the technical underpinnings because architecture is also about how it makes you feel. Yeah. And living in a home where you have daylight and changing daylight throughout the seasons it has a huge impact on your soul. Mm -hmm. It's harder to capture. There's no numbers here. This yeah. is experiential. Yeah, in fact, we, we even started turning the lights on when we got here, and then we just decided to turn them off because oh, it's okay. just the, the natural light is so pleasant. In here. Yeah. Even on an overcast day. I've had clients tell me that years later, it took them a while to figure out. They can't even put their finger on it. It's like, I, I'm just, you know, it makes me happy to be in mm -hmm. my house trying to figure out what is it and then realizing. Man, it's all it's that light and then the shadow and especially in the in the winter months in Minnesota we don't get out as much as we should right. we lack vitamin D because of it and so having access to broad sunlight in the dead of winter is is a tremendous asset to people yeah it's it's you you feel like you're more connected to the outdoors with with this kind of exposure. Yeah, and, and the funny part there is you're connected and disconnected at the same time. Mm -hmm. um, as you may have noticed, my walls are fairly sizable. They're about yeah. two feet thick with insulation. We have triple pane windows. Oh, yeah. 
Um, so uh, the, the irony of that is, is with the large glass, I can see what the weather is, but I don't hear it. Um, so sometimes you find yourself looking out with the trees, you know, bowed to the ground because there's a storm going on. <laughs> it's yeah. windy. It and is quiet in here. I, I had, yeah. yeah. You don't notice that yeah. at all. Um, another great example was we, we did a retrofit to the standard in South Minneapolis on Lake Nokomis, and that's about a mile or less from the airport. Mm-hmm. And the house was so noisy prior to the retrofit that when you were sitting at the dining table like we are, every time a plane was coming in overhead, your conversation would have to stop. Hmm. Once we retrofit the house, they don't notice the planes at all anymore. Wow. And I remember we had an open house some years ago where I purposefully opened a window and the planes were going. We had about 100 people in the home. And again, every time the planes would go, that noise would be disruptive. And so I waited for one to come in and then close the window, which cut off that noise instantly. Mm-hmm. And the room just went completely silent. And everybody had this sort of epiphany of like, wow, this is just incredible. And so when you're in an environment, in an urban environment with, with you know, busy roads or airport or train yard or what have you, there's, there's some additional benefits here to to helping yeah. shelter that yeah yeah and I, I actually didn't even consider sound in architecture until probably within the last year listening to um <clears throat> i think like 99 percent invisible yeah and uh um a couple other like sound related podcasts where they start talking about sound and architecture yeah and how important that that is especially becoming with all the the different sounds that are i mean even even just coming from our phones the exterior sounds like yeah. you know, traffic people playing loud music just all the noise, like yeah. how, how distracting and how that's creating stress and anxiety in us. Yes. And increasing cortisol levels. I think that's especially true if it's like a permanent sort of base yeah. level that at, at a certain noise level, I would agree. I mean, on, on the flip side, my daughter is a drummer. There's a drum set on the balcony just above us here. And so mm. um, the, the good news for the neighbors is as long <laughs> as we keep the yeah. windows closed, they, you literally can't hear that on the outside. It does, is yeah. it, does it reverberate pretty loud within the home. It does. Yeah. So we decided to go for an open floor plan. Yeah. And the one thing, just like the open office plan, they all suffer from basically being echoey and kind of noisy. So mm-hmm. when somebody does dishes in the kitchen, the whole house sort of participates in it. But that was a choice we made. The bedrooms are all soundproofed in this house and so are the doors. So when you close the door in a room itself, then you're cut off from that again. But when you're in the open space, it's we all participate. Mm-hmm. And in part, that was by design yeah um i i like the idea also with my children that we're aware of each other and we hear each other so that you know especially teenagers we all were there once you know you have sort of a tendency to retreat and Mm -hmm. isolate and so we enjoy the fact that when we're in the space here we work with each other we have to be respectful to each other and and but we also enjoy each other we also have a piano so yeah. when my daughter plays piano, then it's, it's joyful for everybody. Mm-hmm. Uh, we we lo- all love music. We watch concert videos. And so you can participate in that from anywhere. So it's a, it's a little bit of a blessing and a curse. Yeah. There are certainly days when, you know, we would wish that it wasn't quite as open as it is. And then there's others where it's just the best thing. And it's a choice that we mm-hmm. make, you know. Yeah. Well, it, and you, you, you consciously chose to, like, soundproof the room. So you can yes. retreat to those and yes. <clears throat> have your silence and privacy. Or you can just leave yeah. <laughs> for a little bit. Oh, sure. Uh, right. Which, the, you know, of yeah. course, the, the, the interesting thing there is that this our first year in this house started with the COVID lockdown. Yeah. Um, so we went from not knowing this house i speak more for my family of course i designed it so in my head i've known this for and and built it literally right (laughs) but they haven't and so for them you can imagine we lived in our old home about 18 years so they move in here and they spent all their time in here for the next year so for them it was certainly a very intense experience yeah um, uh, and and not intended to be that way, right, right. but we we learned this house very quickly and intensely, so mm-hmm. to speak. So we talk, we've been talking a lot about residential because that's yeah. your specialty, and we I asked you briefly about commercial, yeah. um, and I know you don't work so much with commercial. Not that you couldn't, but it's just yeah. not your specialty right now. But is there? And, and I also understand you're the only firm in. Are you the only firm in Minnesota working with the passive? 
homes? No, or? technically not. There is okay. certainly some competition in that space. However, there's not a whole lot of build projects yet. Got it. So there's a handful of colleagues that engage in different aspects of, of passive house design, some maybe more as consultants sure. or project managers. Got it. So most of them not as designers just yet, but there's a couple. And we're looking forward to them coming online and putting projects here on the ground. Um, so yeah, but in yeah. terms of commercial, um, yep. Is there a place for that with, oh, yeah. with the, the pass? Because it's it's technically called passive home, right? Or no, it's called it's passive house, and passive it is house. it's it's a um, it's a direct translation from Germany where it originated, and and so the house there means more building. Okay, um, and that's really it's it's a bit of a misnomer, and it's it's a conversation in passive house circles because yeah. that name often misleads people to think it's a residential thing. It isn't at all. I see. It is a building energy standard that is universal. And if you look around the globe, um, it's been applied to just about anything. Uh, as a matter of fact, in Germany right now, they're finishing in Frankfurt the, uh, the, the General Hospital, which is entirely built to passive house standard. Okay. Uh, it's, it's, I think, one of the largest passive house buildings in the world. Um, there's many uh, multifamily buildings, including here in the U.S. and in Canada, that are built to the standard. Um, there's a North American variant called Fios Plus, which has same origins, but is slightly different. We have a, a multifamily building here in Northeast Minneapolis that's been built to that standard. Uh, and we worked on that as a consultant, and one of my colleagues um, then uh, took it from there and, and continued to stay with the project. So, um, yeah, it is applicable to anything. There are um, concert halls, public pools, uh, mixed-use buildings, uh, warehouses, uh, or, or manufacturing facilities built to this standard. Um, I, I think at this point you're going to have a hard time finding a building category that hasn't. If it has people in it, mm -hmm. if it has heating and or cooling, uh, you can apply it. Yeah, okay. You wouldn't do it to a, to a garage mm -hmm. because your car doesn't necessarily need that. Um, but it's whenever we want to maintain that 70 degrees, 50% relative humidity is when it makes the most sense. Yeah. Now, am I, am I right? Did I read on your website that you had, the, you had built the first or designed the first Passive home in Minnesota, passive house in Minnesota. Yeah, actually, my business partner did the first certified one in the United States or on the continent wow. period in the Americas, if you want to go that far. Uh, that he designed it in 2005. It got built into 2006. Okay. Uh, and that's up in Bemidji, Minnesota. Okay. And then, uh, you know, we had a lot of firsts. I think we did the first certified in Michigan, Wisconsin, Minnesota, the United States. We did the first cold climate retrofit anywhere in the world to that standard. So, We've, and that's just par for the course. When you're in that space, we sort of conquered a new continent, right? So mm -hmm. it's in a way, I don't pat myself on the back for it. Right, it just right, so right. happened. And it still is that way, you know, wh wherever we go. Uh, so if I go to, I don't know, we're working on a project in Lafarge, Wisconsin or whatever. It's mm -hmm. probably the first within that sort of region. Right. And it's quite often that way. Yeah, and, and yeah. accolades are nice and, and they're they're worth talking about. I, I, I'm interested in how far it's come since those first were yeah. established. I mean, is it is it something that's starting to catch on? Oh, absolutely. Or, okay. Yeah, and the last, I would say, the last two, three years have been incredibly transformational um, and with a number of factors contributing to that. Uh, we've seen some um, official adoption in places like Vancouver, New York City, uh, maybe the Boston area, Pennsylvania, um, where the program has found its way into reach codes, codes, um, financial support mechanisms for affordable housing and things like that. So now it's manifesting itself as a target that developer have to, developers have to develop. Yeah. So that's been a big part of it. And quite honestly, the COVID year, I think, has brought a lot of acceleration to it simply because the global passive house community has been able to come together so closely. Mm -hmm. um, all of a sudden, local, regional events had to be canceled. Everything moved online. Well, the benefit of that is you can now have people from anywhere join in this and also at the same time make it more accessible, right? So if you're interested in passive house and you're in a region where there isn't really anybody doing it, well, online you can find these people and utilize those resources. And so we've seen the adoption rates just absolutely skyrocket, which always happens when you're in a new market. Right. At some point you get this curve sort of kicking up steeply. And, and that's exactly what's happening now where 
I remember when I did my first passive house, residential passive house, I think it was the third in the country that got built. Um, and that particular building at the time, you know, there were three. I think there were two more in planning. There was a moment in time, maybe in 20, 2009 or 10 or something, when I think my firm had put half of all certified passive houses in the United States on the ground because wow. we had done that, whatever, four or five or six or whatever it was. <laughs> and, and maybe there were 10. Um, and so we've long surpassed that. Similarly, uh, there's annual conferences. The very first Passive House conference, I think, had 13 attendees, mm. uh, you know, and that had grown the last in-person events. Generally, there's literally a couple of thousand people. Wow. Um, and, and when you move online, um, you'll, you'll get crowds, you know, even for happy hours, four or five hundred people regularly, weekly that join in in these events. So it's I think we're getting there. And um, maybe one other piece on that, it is a it is um, sort of a, a, a transformational thing. Passive House forces subjects to the forefront that are good for any building. Air tightness, super insulation, good windows and doors, heat recovery, ventilation. These concepts provide benefits to any building, whether you make a Passive House or not. And so we've seen that in Germany where the program was formalized first, there's not necessarily a huge adoption rate of the passive house standard as in certified passive houses, but it has completely changed the marketplace because now all new buildings have better than cold insulation, are air sealed, heat recovery ventilation, and the good window has all but replaced a mediocre window. Is there something that the layperson would see uh, visually, like aesthetically, that would identify a passive house or is it kind of there can be but there doesn't have to be okay i would say in cold climates like ours you will find if available lots of windows on the south side for those passive solar heat gains so that could be a giveaway the other thing is a fat wall, but a fat wall, uh, it depends on what materials you use. Right. If you use more space age materials, it could still be slim, but higher performing. And the other thing is um, it's not always in your face. Mm. Uh, here, you know, when I look at my window jams, because I have large windows, it shows up where they meet the wall because I can actually look at the wall sideways. But if you had a home that was a little bit more traditional with just small punched windows where you just basically look out straight, you may never really get that sensation. So I don't think that there are dead giveaways, but I think for people who understand what it is, if they look for it, they'll definitely find it and see it. And can you, I'm assuming, I, 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 probably, I think I I know the answer to this but can you take a can you do a renovation oh yeah to, okay okay yeah so they actually formalized that program i think in maybe 2009 we did um a, and we weren't the only ones but we did a pilot project um here in, in minneapolis which actually became the first certified one in minneapolis and um that uh, study led to a, a program called enter fit Mm. which is an energy efficiency improvement with passive house components. So the, the FIT, they spell P-H-I-T, enter FIT. And that has <laughs> since become the global retrofit version of passive house. Yeah. Slightly different targets because you can't necessarily right all the wrongs in existing right. buildings. You can't change the orientation right. and stuff like that. But there is a certification It has to, it has to be a, can, a good candidate for yes. that kind of thing. And often renovations are done over time. So they also have uh, basically a step-by-step step protocol there, how you work your way through that uh, ultimate, you know, making it the ultimate version of itself over time. Mm -hmm. It's a tough deal to work in. I, I've done a few of those and it's a lot of work, uh, but extremely rewarding when you do it because um, those buildings outperform any standard new home by or building by a factor of you know, eight, nine, ten. Yeah. So the people listening or watching are probably your peers in the industry. There's probably some people who are just curious, interested yeah. in design in general. Um, there's probably some photographers listening because <laughs> they follow me. Um, like, what's what's one last thought you kind of want to just leave everybody with? I know that the passive house is uh, very important to you and your firm. Yeah. Um, and I know we could talk about this for hours, as you mentioned. Yes. But if we had to sum it up into one last thing you want to leave everybody, either to research or just kind of look into or consider, or just something yeah. you really want to share about it. Like, I think one of the things that's really important to me is that we're not really facing physical obstacles to making high performing buildings anymore in our marketplace today. The real obstacle is in people's heads. Mm. Maybe like the adoption of electric cars where some people simply say, I don't want one. Yeah. I just don't want one. 
And we face similar struggles here because once people understand passive house, the first question I always get is, why aren't we building all buildings this way? Mm -hmm. Because it's the only way compatible with the future we say we want for ourselves. And I have learned in the last 15, 20 years that the biggest obstacle is the human mind. Mm -hmm. It's simply the fear of the unknown. And so what I would leave people with is to keep an open mind. This is not witchcraft. It's entirely based on building science. Uh, listen to experts and professionals and follow their guidance. And that may be true right now for, you know, healthcare, uh, social justice. I think in our society, we face a lot of challenges where we have that problem. Maybe uh, the visions are all out there, but we struggle as a society to follow on the, on the right path or one that is most promising. And I would say that's, that's what I want people to take away from this is that to me, passive house is a paradigm that we need to adopt whether you certify a project or not, not so important, but that paradigm is, is really key to making um, the, uh, the energy transformation and the climate neutrality that we seek a reality. If we don't do that, we're simply not going to get there. And for the people who work in this space, they see this clear as night and day. So it is not an elective. And that's why I say it's foundational, not aspirational. Mm -hmm. And we need to change our attitude towards that. And we also need to be demanding especially us consumers, um, because the industry will tell you, well, we can't make them right now because nobody wants them. So it's a typical chicken and egg thing. The legislature is completely lagging behind. Our building codes are as archaic as they get. And so anybody who wants a good building, even average homeowners know that and will ask any builder or architect to overbuild. So we've almost, we're, I feel like we're in a place where we've already left that framework behind. And there's still lobbyists fighting that that will never change. And so, you know, mentally, we have to completely leapfrog that and just get out of that space. So I would like to think that the choice is yours or anybody's and that you have to demand much better and much better is out there. And by doing it, you're helping everybody else get to the same level quicker because as in any industry, adoption leads to cost savings, leads to you know efficiencies, right. uh, leads to a different public perception. Um, so we're really in that space right now where the Tesla of buildings has been with us for now 30 years. We're still struggling to adopt it. So that would be my call to action. You know, get out of your shell, ask people for much better buildings that's uh, pretty fascinating i hope people will take that to heart again yeah. I'm, I'm not an architect obviously but i i uh, i'm hoping that your peers maybe pick, took something from your insight yeah so fascinating information for me as well sure and i appreciate all the time you were able to give thank you appreciate it too Thank you so much for listening to Midwest Architecture and Design. If you're an architect, designer, or builder and would like to collaborate on a project together and be interviewed on this podcast, please reach out to me at jordanpowers.com. Now, if you'd like to help keep me motivated to continue making these, just knowing that you found this worth watching or listening to is reason enough. So please do me a favor and subscribe wherever you're listening to this or watching so that I know what kind of reach this is getting. Also, if you're listening to the audio-only version of this, you can watch the episode for free at MidwestArcDesign.com. And be sure to follow me on Instagram at Jordan Powers without the vowels.